and I'm delighted to welcome you um, to the Science Museum and to the IMAX Theatre. Uh, we're going to give you a glimpse of the future of medicine, a nice thing to do at the Science Museum, a, a kind which is tailored to you with a new book, Virtual You, which has just been published by Princeton University Press. It's the third book written by the partnership of Peter Coveney of UCL and Roger Highfield of the Science Museum. And their first was a bestseller, I think that was The Arrow of Time, and their second uh, was Frontiers of Complexity, which also received great critical acclaim. And so this, their third book, builds on those to show how to blend the biggest computers, the smartest theory, and the biggest data to make medicine that's truly personalized and predictive. And it's been picked as one of the Financial Times' books to read in 2023, so we'll be among the first to be able to do so. Before we show a film that gives a sense of what can already be done when it comes to pandemics, um, we're gonna meet three experts in human digital twins, and we're going to talk first um, to Peter and Roger. Welcome. Uh, welcome, Roger and Peter. Thank congratulations on the book. Um, and Peter, I was thinking this uh, interesting quote I liked in the book, um, which says, we are drowning in a sea of data and starving for knowledge. And I wondered if that was a useful way to thinking about the problem you've identified with modern medicine. Swimming in a sea of data, this is what can happen when you unleash the power of computers and supercomputers in an unthinking way. They're capable of generating enormous quantities of data. And uh, it tends to then lead itself to the idea that we might use things like artificial intelligence and machine learning, which depend heavily on those things. But as our conversations will show today, what we actually need is an understanding of these processes, what's happening, so that we can actually understand medicine better to make it more of a science than it currently is and to be able to explain what things need to be done to us as individuals to rectify our ailments or more positively to tell us about you know, preferred lifestyle choices. Can you give an example of, of a field of medicine um, in which you particularly see this working of, of, of its benefits? So one of the biggest illustrations of the fact that uh, medicine isn't working uh, is the pharmaceutical industry. I'm not sure how many people here are aware of this fact that it takes on average 10 years uh, of the order of two billion dollars to produce a single drug so it's a one-size-fits-all idea and that's convenient for the companies but we all know in the post-genomic era that that's very rarely the case and indeed the successful drug is seldom uh, useful for more than 50 percent of the population anyway this is a model that's simply not up to what we require in the modern era. So we need to do things in a far smarter way than we have done. Um, and Roger, when it came to writing the book, how did you go about doing it together? And what were you trying to achieve? Well, I think what we really loved about the idea, I mean, you know, we, Peter and I have been talking about science since uh, the 70s. Crikey, it goes back a long uh, way. And Okay, Peter's now doing uh, work in the digital twin sphere, you know, recreating the blood circulation of a real uh, living person. But what we loved about, the, about writing about digital twins, and this is the first sort of general book on human digital twins, is that there are so many big issues you can explore. You know, can you describe all the workings of the world uh, with an algorithm? Well, not necessarily. Can you trust AI? I mean, I, every time I hear or play around with chat GPT, you know, I kind of feel like I'm, I'm listening to Jacob Rees-Mogg. You know, it's sort of, uh, it's very smooth and plummy and convincing. And then you think about it, think, hang on, no, imperial units for everything is not a good idea at all. It's rubbish. So chat GPT can generate a lot of rubbish. Can you trust digital computers? Actually, you can't in certain circumstances, and we explore that in the book. You know, how do we improve um, AI? So big AI, why are biologists suspicious of theory? How useful is quantum computing? Um, there's so many big issues there. It just seemed very rich territory indeed. So it's a very multidisciplinary book, basically. And just a little practical question about how you, you managed to write it, given your, you know, your different approaches. You know, almost like what did each of you put into the book, and how did it synthesize? 
I mean, it's, it's a kind of panel beating exercise. So um, uh, sometimes Peter would draft bits, I'd draft bits, then we'd swap them, uh, shuffle them around. We've got Ingrid, our editor, out there. Ingrid would weigh in and say, hang on a moment, I don't understand what on earth you're going on about. And we just iterated and iterated and iterated until we were both happy. Excellent. Right, I think we're going to play the film now, and it's, it's terrific. It gives you a kind of glimpse of a future where doctors might be able to make health casts when medicine is personalised and predictive, and you're going to be the first British audience to glimpse this future. Uh, this new film was created by um, Peter and Roger with Mariano uh, Vasquez, uh, Fernando Succietti and Guillermo Marin of the Barcelona Supercomputing Centre. They also got help from the LRZ in Germany, home of another supercomputer, and from SURF, the collaborative organisation for IT in Amsterdam too, so a real international collaboration. Um, this movie shows the potential of digital twins in dealing with the next pandemic. It complements the museum's brilliant Injecting Hope exhibition, uh, which focused on how scientists managed to create a COVID vaccine in um, less than a year. And just before we start, I should say, um, all the projections, you'll see these things animating the spread of the pandemic. That's all based on real data. I mean, it's fascinating. And then I'm going to introduce the rest of our wonderful panel and open up with them to a discussion. So let's have a look at this film. Over the past decades, viruses spread by animals have caused severe diseases in people. That was the story of SARS... MERS, and now, COVID-19. As the global population surges in coming decades to almost 10 billion people, changes in land use will prime the planet for future spillovers of infections. The question is not if they will be future pandemics, but when. And most importantly, will we be ready? We just might. There is a new weapon in the fight against global diseases, the supercomputer. During the global COVID-19 pandemic, we used them to simulate almost everything. From the microscopic world of the virus to the many possible ways to treat the infection. Understand how the virus spreads. Or predict the future course of the pandemic. Using supercomputers, we can look at the spread of the virus as it travels through the air from one person to another and study the effectiveness of masks, air conditioning and social distancing. Or move down to the microscopic level and simulate the virus in amazing detail to understand how it pirates our cells to reproduce. This coronavirus uses spikes to latch on to human cells, coating them with compounds called glycan chains to make them invisible to our immune system. Computer simulations have revealed chinks in this armor, small regions free of glycans that are vulnerable to human antibodies. Enzymes like this one help coronaviruses infect our cells. Scientists can simulate in a matter of hours how this and other targets respond to hundreds of drug candidates to find new antiviral drugs, which may work for new variants, even novel human coronaviruses. But a promising treatment can sometimes come at a high cost. Because viruses borrow our biochemistry to multiply, they are hard to combat without also damaging infected cells. The drugs employed to treat the disease can occasionally cause life-threatening side effects, such as disturbances to the rhythm of the heart. Luckily for us, simulations of human cells, tissues, and organs are becoming ever more sophisticated, allowing doctors to explore the effects of an infection on the entire body. We are entering the era of exascale computers. Machines a thousand times faster than the previous generation. More powerful machines combined with new knowledge, artificial intelligence and smarter software will help us understand and fight these silent enemies. When the next pandemic comes along, and it will, the virtual human will be ready to simulate the virus and its effects. 
and devise solutions to the pandemic at pandemic speed. There's a great tone to that film, which was really upbeat. And it's like, when the next pandemic comes along, which it will, <laughs> we'll be ready. So um, um, I, feel, I feel we're realistically prepared for what lies ahead. I don't know what everyone else thinks. I really enjoyed that. Right. So an insight on that terrific screen. If you haven't been to see an IMAX film here yet, you should come. We had 2001 A Space Odyssey. It was amazing the other week. So our distinguished panel are all going to come and join me now. Andrea Townsend Nicholson, who holds a chair in biochemistry and molecular biology at the University, at University College London, welcome. Bianca Rodriguez, who's professor of computational medicine at the University of Oxford, and a Wellcome Trust senior research fellow in basic biomedical sciences, welcome to you as well. And Dr. Jasmine Aguado Sierra, who is a Ramon E. Cayal fellow at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Welcome to you too, and thank you so so much for uh, coming to be part of this panel. Um, I want to start with you, Andrea. You focus on how cells respond to molecular signals. There's a really interesting section in the book about cells and you know what we can do digitally to explore them. Can you tell me a bit about virtual drug trials? Okay. So you cells, hold it nice and close. The cells need to know what's happening around them so that they can respond appropriately. And they do this by having proteins on the surface of the cell that catch very specific chemical messengers or molecules going by, and then they use that information to, to know how to respond. And you can do this with synthetic chemicals to control the behavior of a cell. And the best of these synthetic chemicals are the drugs that your doctor will prescribe for you for things. And the process of screening them in a biological system takes a tremendous amount of time. It takes time, it takes money, it takes resource, you have to have the compounds, the cells have to behave themselves, which is never a given thing. Um, but you can do it computationally. And it's much faster, any molecule you can think of, you can screen virtually on your protein of choice. And sometimes you need to do it very rapidly. So the COVID-19 pandemic was a fantastic example of needing things in a hurry. And what people were doing were screening billions of known chemical compounds to try and find something that would work to stop the spread of the virus, mitigate the effects from things that were known. So it's drug repurposing. Right. Um, you mentioned proteins there. Can you tell us a bit more about how we could use virtual proteins then to create designer drugs? So Peter's point about the pharmaceutical industry working effectively with one drug when it worked for many people, if you're not that person, and if you have a disease that's caused by a mutation in a protein, you can look at that virtual protein and find the best compound that would fit in there and then tune it and tweak it and go back and forth between what it looks like computationally how you test it, how effective it is, does it stay on its target long enough, is it in your body long enough, and we can get very precise computational alignments. So it's a digital twin at uh, an atomic level, if you like. Fantastic. Um, Blanca, you work on virtual hearts, with that great image of the heart we've been looking at on the screen behind us. Can you tell us a bit about how you can use a heart digital twin uh, to understand differences in the response to treatment and disease. Um, so, so, uh, uh, yeah. So uh, that that's the topic of our research, and uh, what we do is um, have a mix of um, data embedded into equations, uh, and that allows us to simulate the effect of disease and drugs on specific cells or populations of cells. Um, or uh, um, also hearts. So we use um, a variety of uh, virtual preparations. And the, the main novelty that we can bring to the, the testing of therapies is that we can um, simulate the response of thousands of cells or thousands of hearts. And those are human hearts. Um, so that's a technology that is not available experimentally. Um, 
the human tissue is, is not really uh, broadly available for drug testing. So very often animals are used and those are different to humans. So uh, our computer models of human hearts are, are much closer to what would happen to the human population. And of course there's ethical issues about not and there having are to ethical use animals. Issues, yeah. and, and you mentioned the need to, um, you know, you turn stuff into equations. So are you inputting data from kind of real individual humans and then you're creating um, digital equations that then can create all these yeah. possible scenarios? Yeah, so the, the, the equations describe the, the either experimental data that have been obtained in, in human tissue or the data obtained in specific people. So imaging, for example, is used to uh, capture the geometry of the, the heart of a particular patient and we can create computer models of that to try to understand specific disease phenotypes in specific patients and how the therapies would act on those. And I was wondering the relationship with industry then, how mm -hmm. important is that to this kind of work? So, for, so we are very much collaborating with industry uh, and pharmaceutical industry and Jasmine can talk also about device companies but uh, in terms of pharmaceutical com companies we are really working with them. Um, it's been traditionally more on the safety side so any every medicine that is released to the market need to be tested in terms of safety and we have had a lot of success in the area of uh, predicting arrhythmia events. Um, okay. So we have produced um, digital twin technologies that can accurately predict um, uh, adverse events um, related to arrhythmias and we've been working very much with them. So it's a lot of fun. Excellent, thank you. Um, Jasmine, you're also working on uh, digital twins of hearts. In silico trials, can you tell us about those? Um, well, yes. Um, in silico trials is what we call when we try to reproduce um, data from a clinical trial using our computational models. Um, so we have been working very thoroughly on trying to implement a clinical trial within using computational models to try to uh, reproduce the effect of drugs or the effect of, you know, uh, different other therapies uh, using medical devices, uh, anything implantable uh, on, on hearts, so that we try to produce information on human, um, at the human level, before any of these therapies go go into into any human, um, so the overall idea is that we we're trying to, you know, lower the number of animal experiments, and we try to reproduce human behavior as closely as possible. Um, so there has been a huge amount of uh, advances in, in that direction. Excellent. We know that one of the issues, especially if you read something like um, Caroline Criado Perez's book, Invisible Women, um, is how often medical data hasn't been sex disaggregated and how important it is. Um, could you tell us a bit about um, some of the things you're discovering? Because I gather you are discovering some useful differences between male and female hearts. Um, yes, uh, it is, this is really interesting and it's really important that we actually take this you know, sex differences within our simulations, uh, because that's something that lacks the actual current science on many of these drug tests or clinical trials or things like that. So, um, you know, our hearts are different for males and females. It's not only the size, generally males' hearts tend to be a bit bigger, uh, but it's also their function. And some of the things that we found extremely interesting is that we have been looking at the effects of hormones and how our hormones affect our function. And hence, they might actually affect the cardiotoxicity for drugs or the effect of different uh, um, devices. So for example, for males, you have testosterone. Uh, you have also variations of testosterone, not only with age, but throughout the day. For females, it's, not, it's also estrogen, progesterone, how they vary through the day and how they vary through your menstrual cycle. Um, so these are things that we're actually inputting within our models and trying to understand, you know, those, that little detail that makes us different and that makes us respond different to different therapies. Excellent. 50% of the population. Very useful. Exactly. Um, 
Peter, you've been um, creating a virtual circulation of an actual person, and uh, it's, it's based on a South Korean woman who died very young. I was fascinated by this section in the book. Um, can you tell us a bit about that, and when that virtual circulation would be hooked up with a heart? So, uh, is this working, or maybe this one does? Yeah. Emphatically, that's better. Uh, the, the code is something we've developed over many years. It's called Hemel B. And uh, that's an, a tour de force in trying to deploy an application on an exascale machine. In order to run a simulation at that scale of the whole human vasculature, you have to be able to command the entirety of a machine like Frontier, which is the new exascale machine in Oak Ridge. So it scales to a colossal number of GPUs. Close. And then you can unleash the simulation of the blood flow in full glory in 3D. Uh, with that patient or person-specific data. So that's already a kind of world first in itself, but then the question is, it's the, is it the first step to the virtual you where you'd like to drive that circulation through the human heart? So indeed, with our colleagues like Yasmin at Barcelona Supercomputing Center with the, uh, the, the code they called Alia, which is behind the simulations we're seeing, the idea is to connect that vascular to, to the human heart. Once you start doing that at that scale, you can ask questions that are rarely addressed in any shape or form by medicine in its present form. And beyond that, you can see where it's going. There are people who work on different organ systems. One of the chapters in our book describes all of these organ systems that people are working on. And the idea is to systematically be able to bolt all of those things together in order to do medicine in a much more holistic way. And, and so did you have a kind of time scale in mind for when we can start to see some of the, the benefits of this? Uh, well, I mean, there's, there are massive technical challenges being able to adapt to the latest hardware and make it run optimally. And then we're talking now about codes that are very large scale already. And connecting can you hold a bit closer? Sorry, the microphone. Th then they're connecting very closely. Uh, very con they need to be coupled very closely effectively together and that's also a challenge. So bringing this to a point where you can immediately use it for a medical purpose is probably of the order of five years away from that. Right, and, and just a bit more about the challenges of making the simulations work at the molecular level um, with those at the cellular level, you know, the organs, the whole body. This is where I think you're alluding to what I'd call multi-scale methodologies, yeah. because we want ultimately to connect the whole human system together from the molecules and the genome to the whole human and even beyond to populations. And that requires an enor enormous amount of high fidelity simulation at different scales connecting to each other. And the computation, computational demands at each level are very different. So you can get dramatically different imbalances in loadings. And so you have to do things to accelerate some of those simulations such the whole thing will keep going. This is actually a space where artificial intelligence and machine learning can be used to replace some of the codes by uh, what we call surrogates that enable the whole thing to keep dancing at a, tu you know, at a speed that's relevant to clinical decision making, which at the end of the net day is what we're trying to do, produce predictions which are actionable, meaning they've got enough credibility that a, a medic or a clinician will decide to take uh, a step on the basis of that. Thank you so much. Um, Roger, so you started writing this book with Peter three years ago. I was wondering, I mean, apart from the fact that you were dealing with a pandemic, what most surprised you as you went into all the details of the research that you were covering? I mean, I, I know uh, Dennis Noble really well, and Dennis um, did the very first heart cell models in the 60s, and it was kind of a thing of wonder seeing this train, chain, chain of discovery. He was um, in turn inspired by uh, Hodgkin and Huxley, who came up with the first mathematical model of a nerve impulse going down uh, a neuron for a squid. Dennis adapted that um, to create a beating heart cell in a very primitive uh, computer in Bloomsbury, where he had to sort of get up at three in the morning to run it. And, um, you know, uh, the output was on teletyper and goodness knows what else. Then to see that work evolve um, into patches of cells, and then in the 90s, something called a connection machine, which is like a primitive supercomputer, uh, highly parallel uh, supercomputer, beginning to model the whole heart. And now seeing things like Alia Red, um, which is so cool that it actually got into a Dan Brown uh, book, 
Um, and the kind of work that Blanca and Yasmin are doing is really impressive. I think also the hardware, we're probably not giving enough away about how awesome uh, the hardware is. Peter's talking about an exascale machine. This is a machine that can do a billion, billion floating point operations a second. So we, we talked to Rick Stevens, who's building an exascale, or helping to build an exascale machine called Aurora, uh, in the States, he was telling us how to keep it cool. He's got three foot wide cooling pipes and it's gonna take 60 megawatts of electricity to run it. That's enough for a small town. If you now think about going to the Zeta scale, um, you might need gigawatts to build um, a Zeta scale machine with conventional technology. So what's interesting about this, this push for ever more exotic computer technology is it's actually driving us to analog processing, which is much lower energy. And of course, you can't get away from the fact that between our um, ears, we've got a 20 watt machine that is truly awesome in its analog capability. And we have to somehow get that analog capability. Maybe quantum computers might offer another way. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I think that really blew me away, just the, the complexity and scale of these new machines. I should say the government has just announced 900 uh, million going into a new exascale machine in the UK. So it's great to see the UK government recognising the strategic importance of this. I was thinking your last book had the word frontiers in its title, Frontiers of Complexity. I wonder uh, how you see virtually fitting in with your earlier books, because it seems to me each of them have dealt with kind of the frontiers of that particular subject area. Yeah, I mean, there, there is a connection, um, part of the fact that we've, we've been, you know, nattering away about science for all these decades. Uh, one is the hour of time um, was really looking at a puzzle in physics, which is that time's represented fundamentally differently um, in different bits of physics. So um, Newtonian mechanics, you know, for cannonballs and so on, quantum theory, relativity, don't really care whether time's going forwards or backwards. But if you look at the second law of thermodynamics, that's got the so-called arrow of time, a, a quantity loosely uh, linked with disorder is always increasing. That gives you the arrow. So, um, you know, we, we were arguing, we were in, influenced by a guy called Ilya Prigogine, Nobel Prize winner, who wrote the forward for the book about how to to sort out this puzzle. And there is a link with, with virtual you, because as Peter alluded to, to build a digital twin of a person, you need to stitch together all kinds of different theories, which might actually have fundamentally different properties. So that's, that's one uh, issue. Frontiers of complexity, we looked at emergent properties. So, for example, a happy thought is an emergent property of all the brain cells in your brain. There, there isn't, um, it's a new property that isn't present in brain cells themselves. Um, and emergence is very mysterious and very important to, to modeling. Um, and we also looked at um, the power of computers as well. So there is a kind of thread of thought linking hour of time to front is a complexity to virtual you. Interesting. Sorry, a bit long-winded. I have to say, you can't lose concentration <laughs> for a moment in this session, can you? Like, well, I'm thinking very hard. Um, I've got questions for all of you about kind of projecting ahead of, of the, what we might um, be able to do in the next 10 years. But I wanted to just ask a couple of questions that I think emerge almost from the journalist in me, which is, I mean, straight away I was thinking reading this book and even the title Virtual You, how far are we really talking about this kind of technology really benefiting the rich and the rich north? You know, are we going to see this really benefit people across the world? And I, I don't know who wants to take that. And if you, Peter and Roger, want to take it first. I mean, I, th I think this is a, a really, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's not a new problem. I mean, there are lots of ethical issues raised by, by Virtual You but some of them are very familiar. So privacy of patient data is a, is a classic one. But you're absolutely right, access to the technology is going to be, in the short term, uh, it could be an, uh, an issue. I mean, at the moment, it's more at the research tool end. But actually, you know, we're already seeing uses that uh, do benefit lots of people. So for example, uh, the Food and Drug Administration, which regulates medicine in the States, is now beginning to accept um, digital twin and in silico trials to test things and so on. So there, 
you know, rather than doing lots of trials and lots of different people, you're beginning to do things in, in silico instead, and that's helping to validate new methods and new medicines. Which obviously gets stuff approved faster, potentially cheaper. But obviously, if you're a, a billionaire and you want to build a digital copy of your yourself, you're, you, know, you have the resources to do that, and um, that's not going to be something that anyone... You know, it's, it's, it's going to be a huge undertaking, certainly mm -hmm. in the short term. I don't know if Peter or anyone else wanted to comment on just the issue of accessibility in the first instance or whether Roger's covered it. Well, I, I think he has. And, and also, you, you realise that when we're talking about actionable predictions at high fidelity with very powerful machines, uh, that's a bit like weather forecasting. And that's what happens in weather forecasting. And climate prediction is about this. Making predictions that you know people pay attention to. Uh, the weather is fortunately one time only for all of us, so to speak. Whereas in this technology, we have to run each person individually. So that immediately implies that the scale of the computing is much, much larger in general. So we, we cannot do all of this on very large machines. Mm -hmm. It was part of what I was hinting at earlier, that we need to learn the proper science of these you know, medical issues and then find ways of translating them down onto less powerful machines. And I was hinting at that earlier because of what Roger mentioned, the big AI senses don't just use AI blindly to predict things, but let us use AI disciplined by our understanding of science to accelerate the, the discovery, so to speak. Mm. So that can then be deployed on much less powerful infrastructure. Blank, I think you wanted to yeah, add something. I... No, just try it. I think it's working. Is it? Yeah. Is it working? Okay. Yeah. So yes, I was. I was. I wanted to emphasize that that not all simulations run in in high performance computing. So one of the things that we do is to try to simplify the problem, to to be able to run it in desk, desktop computers. And in fact, some of our uh, technology that were, that is being in use in pharmaceutical companies runs in laptops. And okay. in some sense, it's it's a, a cheap technology. Um, you you do need um, a computer, and that's it. Whereas animal experiments, for example, can be much more expensive. So, in a way, we are making technology available um, more more easily to everybody. And also, the 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 therapies that will um, come through will also be beneficial for everybody. So, in some sense, I think it's a technology that is is, is yeah. good very broadly. I did want to raise ethical concerns then. I mean, several of you, including Andrew, have talked about, you know, the fact that currently with this stuff we have to do on animals and some of what we're talking about here could change that. Um, there's a practical issue about the anxiety about AI. And it's been really interesting reading a book focused on the medical um, potential for it, which is different to it, sort of replacing jobs. I wonder what all your thoughts were about those ethical concerns, not least on the day that I think um, Steve Wozniak and Elon Musk for what we care about, his ethical concerns. Um, and a load of actually engineers at places like Open Mind and Google and Deep Thought have all come out and Amazon and said they're concerned. Um, I'd love to know, maybe start at Yasmin um, and come down this end, your thoughts about the ethical potential of concern opened up by this. Um, I mean, you know, when you're looking at all of the data that goes to AI, and the outcomes from that AI. It really depends on the specific, um, you know, it, it's this big black box, which can be very, very, um, you know, dangerous at, at, at some point. So my view really is that the technologies that we are developing can be actually part of that input to that AI so that it becomes less um, you know, dangerous in that sense and with less of those ethical problems that might arise when you are taking you know, the knowledge of something, of 100 million somethings, which you do not really know. Um, so we are not, I don't think that AI is neither our enemy or, or will, you know, I, I think it's something we can actually employ in a much safer context, in a much safer way, using some of the kinds of models and, and simulations that, that we use the, or that we create daily. Yeah. Um, Andrew next and then Blanca. Okay. I was going to come at it from a slightly different way, which is that all technology has ethical issues that surround it. 
and the more established a technology is, the better an understanding you have of it. So what these things really involve is a massive risk assessment to understand what the problem is and how to apply appropriate control measures to manage the risk. And whilst people have varying opinions on AI, on the safety of the technologies, we're actively trying to find out what people think. So when we go out to public engagement events, we give people questionnaires and we take back the answers. We've done the London South Bank, um, the, the talks on London South Bank. I've gone to supercomputing conferences and just toddle off with this little A5 questionnaire with a few short questions. And the really interesting field in it is the free form field of, you know, what do you think about this? And people globally have questions about, are my data safe? Will my data be sold off to a company? Will have have control of my digital twin? Um, what about the technologies? And there are a lot of people who are concerned about the inclusivity element. Is it going to be accessible for everybody? Is it going to be fair? I think it's okay to have my tax money go into this if it's something that's I mean, available for everyone. Do you have any observations about the accessibility, given there's a huge concern about the under-representation of people from, you know, minority groups, um, you know, and depending on your socioeconomic background and so on? Well, the under-representation gets levelled out when somebody goes to see their GP, doesn't it? And so when you can put these technologies in the hands of clinicians to help them with informed decision making and when you have a capacity to take from the genomics up that allows diversity to be accounted for in the decision making process, that's a much better leveler, but it's new yeah. and people are afraid of new things. and. They shouldn't be feared, but they should be respected and watched and monitored and tuned to be well appropriate said. to our use. Well said. I'm Blanca. The, the, the only idea I would, um, I would include in what has already been said is the idea of uncertainty around the simulations and what they tell us. So, and also how the, the, the data that are coming from those simulations are used and how, what is the risk in using those simulations. So, the, the, the uncertainty around the simulations, because we don't know everything about a particular heart, for example, it's very, it's very likely that our simulations will be wrong in some way. So, it's very important to quantify what is the certainty you have in the results you're getting from those simulations. And that's a very important aspect, also that it has ethical implications. Um, when you're using a new technology. And that is considered in the regulatory framework for these technologies. So there are, there are methods to quantify that uncertainty and that's, I think, ethically very, very important as well. And also it links with the risk in how those data are used for decision making. And that is all included in the framework um, for regulation. Thank you. Andrea, briefly. There's also a really yeah. important element and that's education. The more people understand about the science that underpins things and the relevance it has to them, the better informed their decision making can be. So we invest a lot in our universities in teaching these technologies, but also their uses and the considerations that go Thank around you. them. And people need to, to be able to okay. take advantage of the information. Peter. Well, the main thing uh, when we're talking about medicine is that historically it doesn't have a good track record in using theory and predictions. And I think everyone here has probably grasped what we're getting at, the ability to do some sort of prediction which is of sufficient fidelity that an action can be taken. It might be a surgeon before they make an intervention, which drug you take, or as an individual, what life course you choose to adopt and you want the credibility. But in medicine, that's not been the case. It all changed in COVID. In this country, every day, on the front page of the newspapers, lo and behold, there were models from people I know predicting the number of cumulative deaths if we had or did not have lockdown. This is almost unprecedented in the biomedical domain. Those models could not be AI or machine learning. We didn't have any data. There was no precedent. They are deterministic, in inverted commas, mechanistic models. They have small number of parameters which you tune, but that speaks to what uh, uh, Blanca is talking about. They have uncertainties in them, but you can then try and control them. 
by the time you move to an AI model, and I'm thinking now of a famous one called AlphaFold that was recently propagated, the number of parameters in those models is astronomical. It's 100 million parameters. And in a chat GPT-4 or something like that, it's orders of magnitude more, 10 to the 15. How on earth do you understand what those parameters mean? They're bereft of any, let's say, physical biomedical sense because they're just fitting parameters. And that's the challenge, to know how to deal with what's being spewed out from such predictions. It's very different from a predictive mechanistic model. Thank you so much. And Roger on this, on the ethics. Well, I think, um, uh, as everyone's alluded to, you know, you train a deep learning system and it's only as good as your training set. So if you don't train it on very good, very well curated data, it's going to give you rubbish. Um, it's not good at predicting surprises because it's never seen a surprise uh, before. These are black boxes. We don't actually know what's going on inside them. Um, there's, you know, the way that they're optimized and so on is sort of almost more like rule of thumb than by theory itself. They haven't got any common sense. So you can train them, you know, to tell the difference between... Um, you know, uh, a, a muffin with raisins in it and the face of a Pekingese or something. But it doesn't have any conception of what those things are. That's why Peter and I argue in the book that actually AI does have a, a big role in, in virtual you, but actually almost curated by the kind of physics-based models we're talking about. That's why we talk about uh, big AI. And the other thing is, just as an ex-hack, we only ever hear about AI successes, you don't hear about the many times, like for instance during COVID, when they tried to take lung scans and predict whether someone had COVID or not. Many of those things didn't work That's at all. Really so you part only book, hear about yeah. the few successes. There's plenty of AI failures. Yeah, you were there. speaking when you went as a news hack as opposed to different kinds of hackers. Yes. But yes, <laughs> um, a really interesting part of the book is how much of the failed research doesn't get picked up, doesn't get reported on. Um, and that's really important too. Right, I want to ask each of you to look into the future and think about 10 years from now, what kinds of things do you think we might be able to do with digital twins? So Yasmin, the future of in silico trials. Um, well, one thing that I think is going to happen is that we're going to be able to use some of our tools to actually um, predict um, situations or um, therapies in humans um, before we even try that therapy in a human. So um, I think this is, we are working towards that. There's, of course, a lot of way there between the validation, verification of our models. Um, but I do think that's something that's going to happen very soon. Okay. Um, Blanca, the impact on animal experimentation. Well, that's already happening. Um, so pharma companies are already using modeling and simulation and have replaced some of the animal experiments they, they were performing. So now it's a matter of expanding the number of applications um, and and the number of um, things we can predict. So if we're talking about uh, prediction of arrhythmias, we've done that. Now we need to uh, predict the effect of drugs on contractility, for example, or on flu uh, the fluid flow. So it's expanding the number of applications from already a very strong point. And, and it's very similar to what uh, Jasmine was saying. Um, it's about uh, working very slowly with uh, them on validation and verification and and building a very solid structure around the technology. Okay, Peter, my question for you then. Future of molecular end, um, of, of the molecular end of things and what it takes to perform simulations at enormous scale on exascale machines such as Frontier. Right, so the problem we, we referred to at the beginning was that it takes 10 years and $2 billion to produce one drug. That's not good enough. So what we're currently interested in then is indeed using the almighty power of an exascale machine to do a better job. And one of the problems is to, that one, ha one has to avoid sequentially trying to optimize one part after another of a drug until you've hit the clinical trials and it fails very late. And that's when it costs a huge amount of money. We need to be able to do, probe all of these things and not experimentally initially. So I'm talking about now the entire preclinical pipeline, not just the initial part of drug discovery, which uses all the methods we're talking about here, not purely molecular simulation, but cases such as what's the toxicological impact of this thing, what other detrimental effects may be 
uh, on this uh, caused by, to individuals by this drug as we go from the beginning up, so that we're optimizing against all of those things from the word go, not trying to bend the, the development later on. So because to do that on a very, very large machine starts to become a feasible... Undertaking. Because there's something in the book about the importance of theory, and I mean, this reminds me of like a kind of trivial example. It's in my head because I read it in Caroline Crowded Perez's newsletter, but like the drug Viagra, you know, when it was invented, they thought it had a particular use, and it was an accident they found out that it was useful for what we know they use it for now. And it turns out they've now discovered a new benefit for women particularly, which is medical. And I'm just wondering if this is the kind of thing which you're talking about, potentially you, you can spray this array of ideas um, at something and see all yes. these possible benefits. And the idea is go. that you can personalise it so that you're not just doing some generic case of optimization, but you're trying to carry as much of individuals along with you so that you will discover cases where uh, we know that already happens, uh, you know, that a drug can be incredibly powerful in a particular context which you didn't expect it to be uh, 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 operating on before. Uh, but now, if you're able to do a workflow which is of such enormous proportions here, you have got better chance of spotting those things and then tracking the development beyond that And point. presumably the flip side of that, was that terrible drug that was being prescribed for morning sickness that turned out to... Thalidomide. Thalidomide. Yeah. I mean, I know that there must be so many medical advances since then anyway, but again, is that something that we're talking about potentially being able to anticipate much earlier That's in the pipeline? That's what I'm getting at, yeah. trying to see all of those things, because yeah. we know that you know, no two people are the same. Cancer is a very good example of what ultimately is a rare disease because everyone's case is different. And again, if you use just statistical inference on this, uh, which is a style of AI and machine learning, that's actually what it's doing. You're just trying to look at lots of previous cases and infer yeah. what the next one is. But if you're in the limit where each person is an individual, that doesn't work. Yeah, that's so exciting. So your example Andrew. about thalidomide is yeah. really good because it has an effect in a very specific window. I think it's something like five weeks during human fetal development. And if you can model that process of development for the genotype of the fetus that's developing, you would be able to pick up those sorts of effects when you are doing that as part of your drug screen. The thing that I'd like to see yeah, in the, please, do in the future, um, having spent a lot of time teaching biologists how to use computers as part of the dual fluency of being able to do experiments and do computation, I think we're increasingly going to see people in the way that they now Google their health symptoms, perhaps starting to develop the first step in what they think they might need as their personalized <laughs> therapeutic. So we might have some crowdsourcing assistants that can then get something to a level that needs this big level of exascale Would you endeavor. Embrace? You'd embrace that or do you think it can, because you know, people, People worry about people you know, Googling their symptoms and then going to the GP and saying, right, this is what I've got. You're not worried about that, uh, that poss possibility. Or There's going to be I the need. whole spectrum. And that's why education is so important, yeah. so that you can sift out more reasonable. There, there, w there will be ways of filtering things. There are always ways of filtering things. And hopefully the good things surface and the ones that are less desirable or less achievable don't. OK, a very good optimistic attitude. Roger. Well, you know, current medicine is a bit like trying to drive down the road looking in a rearview mirror. It's looking uh, back at trials done on people that are a bit like you many years ago. When you get a drug, uh, it might work for you. Actually, it's quite surprising. A lot of very common drugs only work for about half of people. Um, others, you know, produce side effects. I think further down, what, what we really hope with this kind of using uh, digital twins is that medicine will become truly personalized um, and truly predictive so it's worked out for you and so Peter's done some trials uh, on this um, uh, German supermuck not a very romantic name a German supercomputer showing that you can actually select a drug that would work for a particular patient in an in a reasonable um, time and I think this is going to really change um, some quite, it'll have some very profound effects. Like, what do we mean by healthy? Mm -hmm. You know, when we can make health casts um, just as easily as we can make weather forecasts, um, you could create hundreds of digital twins of a patient. You could work out whether their lifestyle is the right one for them, you know, let alone drugs and so on. So they might feel healthy and their friends might say they're healthy, but their digital twin is saying, actually, 
uh, you really ought to cut this out of your diet, or Roger, stop drinking that three bottles of claret every night. It's going to end in tears. Um, but once you've got this health casting ability, it's actually going to have a very deep effect on the way that medicine's done. Um, and at the moment, you know, medicine, as I say, it's backward looking. Um, often, when you get a diagnosis, it's just a fancy restatement of the symptoms that you've got. Mm. You know, we're really arguing for theory and understanding in medicine rather than, um, you know, wisdom built on other people's experience. Interesting. Uh, one question that's been on my mind throughout this conversation is there's always this issue, isn't there, as technology moves on, about the danger of formats being obsolete and. How far is that an issue that you've thought about, Peter and Roger? Well, I've got the microphone. I'll, I'll jump in here. It, it's it's a, actually quite um, a, a big issue. And this, there's a, a, an acronym, VVUQ, about validating these models. Because you're absolutely right. If you develop heroic amounts of code, I don't know how many lines of code... Yeah, on the in, equivalent of Betamax. You know, but I mean, it's like gazillions of lines of code customized to run just on one supercomputer yeah. and then someone says actually I want to check whether they, they got it right but I don't have access to that machine and actually that was three years ago and they've upgraded it um, or now they've changed the software it's a non-trivial problem and I know Peter invests a lot of time thinking about this so now I'm going to leave him with a difficult bit of that uh, question. <laughs> It most certainly is a challenge. Uh, at this moment, the proliferation of machines uh, is almost analogous, as some people have said, to a, a Cambrian explosion in the sense that so many different computers now at that scale with different architectures, different operating systems, and then potentially new language paradigms coming up. So the programming of the codes you know, has to be adapted to the different machines at a frightening speed. So it does become a huge risk for the future. We just have to spend more time curating these things. I mean, that problem just occurred to me a couple of days ago with a ma mathematician in Tokyo asked me if he could restart uh, a, a project I did back in 2003 on supercomputers at Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. But our codes from that just barely exist anymore. Oh, yeah. And we'd have to do an awful lot of work to to pro reproduce the code there rather than uh, actually develop something that works on the new machines and then the data might end up behaving in a slightly different way. It is a ever-present problem and challenge for us. Does anyone else want to talk about the challenge of formats or go ahead? Well, I think there. part of it when and you start yes, then. building a virtual human, a digital twin of digital twins, you're dealing with different kinds of data on different time scales and in different formats. So we are increasingly moving into data science in whatever aspect we pursue. And we're learning about interoperability, we're learning about merging different formats together in one holistic thing. And I think that this will also be part of the growing discipline. Um, Yasmin. Um, yeah, just absolutely agree on that. Um, every single uh, you know, data source that we use to build one single model comes from absolutely different, you know, areas of science. It can be medical imaging, then we look at, you know, single cell experiments, uh, then we have, um, I don't know, an easy EKG that came from the doctor, that from a particular patient. And we need to be able to merge all of that information together to create this, your vir virtual twin. And this is a problem that we face every day, and it's still something that we will, it's a challenge. Um, but I think as, you know, as we are developing the, the, the codes, um, we are more aware of how we need to integrate everything and keep uh, our codes as, you know, as, as out, uh, updated as possible to run in any supercomputer. That's one particular case of the, the code that we use. Um, it may, you know, it might not be the most efficient for this specific computer, but it is the code that will run in any super supercomputer in the world or in your laptop. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One final question. Um, it's written up there when it talks about um, fighting the next pandemic with digital twins, and you know, all that film as well as talking about, you know, the next pandemic will come. Um, final thought from you, Roger, is. When we think about vaccines and how fast we saw scientists developing them, um, do you have any thoughts about what virtual twins might change when we do come to fighting the next one? 
Well, one of the things we mention in the exhibition is an initiative by an outfit called CEPI, three and a half billion dollar initiative, um, where we learn from our experience um, with SARS-CoV-2 so we can develop new vaccines in 100 days flat. And to do that, one of the things that people don't appreciate is that it's because we had established coronavirus vaccine research, uh, you know, Dame Sarah Gilbert and Tess Lamb and, and the rest of the team, Andy Pollard, and they've been working at this for many years, that when, um, when the pandemic came along and it was a coronavirus, they instantly knew that if they got the spike protein, they could in effect slot it into their existing, I'm highly simplifying this, but the, 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 their designs. I think this sort of digital twin research can help very much in accelerating the, um, the search um, for candidate um, you know, vaccines for the big families of animal viruses that are, as something like 20 or 30, that are at risk of spilling over into the human population. And then when the next pandemic comes along, we should be better prepared. That's, I thought that was a nice note to end on. Um, that's all we have time for this evening here in the IMAX Theatre. But fear not, so you may already know this if you've been to one of these lates before, your evening is not over. The museum remains open until 10pm this evening for its lates event. And there are loads of talks and activities ha happening around, so do stick around and explore the silent disco I can recommend. Um, and before we finish, can I just say a big thank you um, to Comp Biomed, the Barcelona Supercomputing Centre, the LRZ, University of Amsterdam and UCL, and of course to our panel today. And if you haven't already bought a copy of it, Peter Coveney and Roger Highfield's book, Virtual You, How Your Digital Twin Will... Oh, I've forgotten the rest of the title. What's the rest of the title? Oh, I can't remember. I can't remember. <laughs> I've lost my final piece of paper. Revolutionize. Will revolutionise medicine <laughs> uh, and save the world or something like that. Then you can, you can buy it. Where can they buy it? In the shop? Site, they, you can buy it in the science museum, all good bookstores. Um, you can, of course, get it on Amazon. Um, and um, there should be there should have been an opportunity to buy some signed copies actually on the way up here as well. I found it right. Um, it's published by Princeton University Press. It's available to purchase from the museum shop and other reputable booksellers. So just choose a reputable one. For those of you invited by Princeton University Press um, to the event that follows, please remain in your seats, and we'll direct you to the event afterwards. All others should please exit via the back of the auditorium. But the silent disco is going to be just as much fun, I promise you. Um, thank you all. Um, I have a lovely evening and one last round of applause for this excellent panel and the authors of this book. Thank you.